Good afternoon or good morning if you are on the West Coast. This is Lynn Quincy and I want to welcome you to today's Hub webinar. Based on our planning call, this is going to be very fun. The title of the webinar is It Costs What? The Role of Media in Exposing Crazy Healthcare Prices. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, that's Lynn, in case you've never met me before. Thank you for coming today, if that's the case. Uh, we have a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, thank you again. Um, all of the attendees' lines are muted until the question and answer period. But don't worry, at that time, we will tell you how to unmute and ask a question. You can also type your question into chat during the uh, panel discussion. And we have allowed a lot of time for questions, so you, we will almost certainly get to you. The webinar is being recorded, so we can post it later for those who aren't able to join today. So just keep that in mind if you are asking a question. And finally, if you're having technical problems, perhaps you're hearing me, but you are not able to log into the webinar software, please call Annalisa Johnson at 202-776-5177. That's 202-776-5177. So let's find out what we're talking about today. This is a little bit of a different format today. We're actually going to introduce um, two people in the media world, a podcaster and a reporter, a mainstream reporter, Dan and Jenny. They're going to tell you about a story that they've written recently uh, that have very similar themes, and then we're going to go into a panel discussion to explore this issue of talking about um, healthcare price variation in the media. And I hope you enjoy it. So with that, I want to kick it off with Dan Weissman, the creator and, creator and host of an Arm and a Leg podcast. Dan, if you would unmute. Tell us a little bit about your podcast, and tell us about a recent story that uh, prompted us to reach out to you. Oh, you bet. Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Weissman, and I, I'm a reporter who runs a podcast. Um, and I'm in a leg, the show about the cost of health care, a little bit like Planet Money, but just for health care. And I was a staff reporter at places like Marketplace, the public radio show, and WBEZ, and started this show last year. Um, and so and we, you know, uh, we, we I like Planet Money. Like we take uh, entertain a bit of an edutainment uh, tack on looking at the cost of healthcare. The story I'll tell you about today is about the price of an MRI. Uh, after our first season, I in the, I, I ask listeners to share their stories all the time, and uh, I got some interesting uh, stories from people about the prices they paid for MRI. Uh, one woman who's been living with brain cancer for 10 years uh, told, said, told me that she, you know, she gets a brain MRI every six months just to make sure the cancer is not growing back, and so far she's doing great. Uh, and then she changed jobs. The new job came with new insurance. She'd been on an HMO, which she'd been happy with, uh, and now she's in this new world of, of shopping around uh, and looking at, at deductibles and all kinds of things. She got and looking to find the, the provider that she wanted to work with. She went to the University of California, San Francisco. She was referred there, uh, got her scan, and then she got a bill for sixteen hundred dollars. Now, on her old plan, she had paid like fifty dollars every time she got an MRI, and she was like, "Oh wait, uh, wait, I know. Isn't this some deal where like the insurance pays a chunk of it, and I'm going to pay some smaller amount?" But then she went on her insurance website and looked it up, and in fact, $1,600 was her share. The, the total, at least according to this bill, that the price that insurance was paying the rest of, supposedly, was $10,000 for this MRI. She was like, that's banana. You know, that's a lot of money. And it wasn't impossible for her to pay, but it was it hurt. That's like, that's like her family's vacation for budget for the year. And so, um, you know, that was a big deal. And she... She happens to work these days in the world of healthcare policy, and she hears people she works with talking about having smart consumers shop around. So she did. She shopped around, and in fact, she found a freestanding MRI clinic. It was like, yeah, we'll do that scan for you for ninety-five dollars. And she went in and had the scan done, and in fact, uh, or that her share was going to be ninety-five dollars. In fact, her share was eighty-seven dollars, and they gave her a bag of chocolate chip cookies on her way out. It was great. Um, but like, what? How can a scan be 
$10,000 or less than 100. Um, I heard from another uh, listener whose baby son had had an MRI. And the total charges on the bill when he got it were for $26,000. Uh, his share is supposed to be $2,000. And he basically called the hospital and said, like, can this possibly be right? And they wrote it back to like, oh, uh, thanks. It turns out we're a little, we try to be in line with what other providers charge. But uh, I guess we're a little high on this one. Tell you what, uh, we're just going to erase your portion of this bill. Instead of the total being 26000 the total was now 24000 And instead of him being on the hook for $2,000, he was on the hook for zero, which certainly, like, in some ways, like, just suggests, like, well, that first price must have been pretty arbitrary to begin with if you could just knock 2000 bucks off it. Um, I talked with my colleague, Elizabeth Rosenthal, who runs Kaiser Health News, and she literally wrote the book about the price of health care uh, called An American Sickness. And she said when she was researching her book, she would ask hospital CEOs, like, why do you charge so much for, say, hip replacements? And she said one of them said flat out, well, you know, sometimes those Saudi sheets will walk in with a suitcase full of cash ready to pay it. <laughs> so she, she compares especially like MRIs, to like booze at a fancy restaurant where they'll just mark things up like crazy because they can. That's the story. Oh, that's pretty shocking. And I think we're about to find out from Jenny, not all that uncommon. Jenny, would you introduce yourself and tell us about your story? Sure. Uh, my name's Jenny Dean. And I cover the business of healthcare for the Houston Chronicle, and something I've been doing for about four years, and uh, have certainly learned a lot uh, in those four years. Uh, and in the la for the last probably two years, I have been tracking um, medical billing and di all the uh, different uh, ins and outs of what patients have to pay, the surprises that they face. And one theme that just kept coming around was the difference between what's called the bill charge. That's what Dan was talking about, that very first number that gets spit out by a hospital or a doctor. That's the bill charge. And what we found out is most health policy um, experts will say that number is fiction, that that number is, that's the starting point. And if you have insurance, you go through a long um, a process. They go through a process. They each have their different um, calculations, and they come to a number of what that what your insurance will actually pay for a procedure. And similar to what Dan found, um, I also looked at MRIs. Um, and in Texas, uh, the Texas Department of Insurance has a, uh, you can actually plug in the procedure and your zip code. And I found for an MRI, the total bill charge, remember that's the first number, ranged anywhere from $5,000 or $5,571 for an outpatient hospital procedure for an MRI to $63,000. And I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Under, under, uh, there, there is no, there, there is no way to, un, to explain away that kind of a, of a spread. But what my story that I looked at was something a little bit different, which is what happens when cash enters the picture. And I uh, talked to an, um, several people who, who said, unfortunately, always after the fact, that they would get, they had procedures done in, in, um, in all three cases, uh, very routine. The one woman, had, her husband had seven stitches. Uh, he, they went into what they thought was urgent care, but it turned out to be um, an emergency room, a storefront emergency room and they were their insurance was billed four thousand two hundred and twenty three dollars for those seven stitches and insurance paid about two thousand of those that leaving them with a uh, yeah there we go uh, if you look it's these these bills are kind of hard to see uh, she got four bills 
totaling for $4,000. And originally, when they went in for the stitches, she got a, let's see, um, $1,257 was what, or um, excuse me, $2,332 uh, for the stitches and $861 for the doctor's fee. And then the next, uh, in the next set of slides, there was a $235 doctor fee to take them out and $795 to the, to the facility. So the grand total was about $4,200. Again, insurance only paid about half of that. They were stuck with it. She started fighting with them, with the facility, and the billing clerk said, hey, you know, if you'd only paid cash. And she said, what do you mean if I'd paid cash? Well, if you'd paid cash, it would have been a lot less. So she went in to check, and it turns out that her charge would have been roughly $200. So that's, um, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, another woman had, uh, she and her mother went in uh, to also to a uh, storefront emergency room, and they both had the flu. They had the same doctor, the same room, the same tests, the same diagnosis, uh, the same treatment. The mother, the older woman, had um, tried to pay with Medicare. They said, we don't take Medicare. So her daughter said, all right, I'll just pay cash for it. And she gave them a credit card. It was $300. Her bill was $1,800. That was what was billed to insurance. So um, my story was about how fictional those, or presumably fictional, those prices are uh, for for people that uh, you know that are that are uh, that are paying through their with their insurance. Uh, the insurance companies are paying some or all of these really large bill charges, and that ultimately comes back to, to everybody. Hello, Jenny. Oh, no, nope. yeah. Je thank you. Sorry, I had mm -hmm. to take a second to unmute myself. Um, well, thank you both for describing some recent stories, which are exactly what led us to you for the purposes of this webinar today. Um, you ha are looking at a phenomenon that completely befuddles not only patients, but also policymakers. And it's really symptomatic of a pretty dysfunctional health system. So I want to explore with you two just a couple concepts that have um, already come up even in the few minutes we've been on the line together and we across just a couple stories. So first of all, both of you have described stories that you investigated that looked at a wide, well, so first of all, we have a variety of price concepts. You've introduced the build price concept, the highest number, the negotiated price concept, that's what insurance pays, uh, the cost sharing, that's what you pay if you have insurance, and then the cash price, which is, seems to bear no relationship to the first three prices. You've also described that this, there's a variety of prices, so, and that speaks to the fact that there's a variety of healthcare prices within a given provider. Do you, um, do you have any, do you want to comment at all on why a provider would have this huge variety of prices right within their own facility? Either Dan or Jenny, please. Um, I, I, could, I, I, I could take a stab at this. I mean, the, most providers are looking to kind of get every dollar they think they can. Um, and so if there's an opportunity to get a dollar by, by putting the sticker price of $5 on something, because you think insurance is going to end up giving you 50 cents, you're going to get 50 cents from, uh, from the patient, like you're going to charge it $5. Because if you, if, you, if, you, if you said you were charging $4, you'd only get 80 cents. Um, that's, that's part of the logic that way. And similarly, if you put the sticker price of $5 on something uh, for the purpose of getting a dollar from insurance, and a patient comes in and says, well, I don't have insurance, but could I give you a buck 25? You're going to be like, yeah, I'll take a dollar 25. That sounds great. Um, I mean, that's the, those numbers are obviously not real numbers, but that's, and the, and the ratios aren't always the same, but that's the logic. I, I so would have to, I, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, please, Jenny. 
Oh, I would absolutely agree with Dan there. Um, what what people told me was that as um, you know, you're shoot, it's kind of um, you know aim high and see what you can get. And um, the the idea is is that some people, um, like for example, a provider in the example of the woman who had um, whose mother paid 300 and she her uh, her insurance was billed and she hadn't made her deductible yet so obviously she had to pay it all it was like twelve hundred dollars and um, I asked about that I I said here's her bills explain this and they said oh well we just discount cash we just we took a loss on that and um, I'm not it's that is one thing that people they will say is we take a loss on um, people who don't have insurance or we have we take a loss on people who can't pay their full bills so I think that in some cases there's some padding going on for those people you know that that's probably built into those typically secretive negotiations when you come up with a reimbursement rate um, to figure that some some people are going to pay more than others Okay, so some of this price variation within a given facility is due to sort of cost shifting across uh, different patients who have different ability to pay, and some is due to just a revenue maximizing approach to pricing things. Um, and in both cases, it does seem very unusual compared to other industries that we purchase products and services from. And you may not either. You may not be in a comment uh, in a position to comment on healthcare vis-a-vis -vis other industries. But if you do want to make a comment on why do we see this in healthcare and not elsewhere, I invite you to do so now. I, I mean, again, I would I I I, uh, I would say one interesting thing that's come up in my reporting in the last bunch of months is that like you and you and your notes for this kind of like well why you know why can't they just make one price and make it fair? And there is, there is, there's all kinds of dances built in, like the dance with the insurance company, where the insurance company is always going to want to say, we want a 40% discount, so you've got to charge, you know, you've got to build that into your initial ask. But the other and more interesting part is that having talked to folks who are financial analysts, um, it turns out hospitals don't know their costs. They don't, uh, that the price setting is completely divorced from the question of what, what their actual costs are. So when they say we took a loss on this, what they're really meaning, what they really mean is we, we got less than we try to get for this and we ask for it and we typically get or we expect to get for this or that we think we want to get for it. Um, but they don't account for what they're doing in a way that allows them to track what things actually cost. There is no MRI that costs where the cost is $26,000. They are all, it's all a combination of, yeah, attempting to kind of cut, make, making sure that you're covering all the costs you're incurring on one side of the ledger with all the revenue you can get on the other side of the ledger. But the relationship between where you take money in and what you're spending money on, um, they are not accounting for things in a way that would allow them to do that at all. Incredible, incredible. Um, so we're, we've been talking about how much, how many different prices there are within a um, per given facility, but we also introduced the idea. Um, I'll back up for a second to Jenny's slide about the amount of um, variation uh, across providers still within the same region. We skipped over it real quick, but uh, Jenny described this variation across um, MRI. Uh, scans within Texas, and I'm going to show you one other piece of information, and I know you can't see the stand, but that's, don't worry about it, it's easy to understand. There was also a really, um, a major study that came out in 2015 that looked at claims data, and it looked very deeply across the country at price variation both across the country comparing region to region, but also within a region. And they found that the most expensive hospital within a region was more than twice as large as the least expensive hospital for a given procedure. And some examples might be within um, Denver, for example, the difference between the highest and lowest cost hospital for an MRI was um, 
almost three to one, 2.87. So, so we have this other source of variation that seems incredible, which is that we're all in the same city, paying the same wage levels, we're treating people um, in similar fashion, yet we still, we can, one hospital can charge twice as much or even three times as much as the other. Do um, either of you, have you been hearing complaints about that from readers that you've talked to, or have you looked at that phenomenon at all? A little bit. I uh, I have a little bit. Of, here's one of the issues. Well, here's one of the biggest problems, and uh, and and whether it's cash, whether it's uninsured, whether it's insurance, um, there's a lot of talk about that you need to get the patient with skin in the game. That the patient needs to be, you know, price shop, and that sounds really good in theory, but because these prices, first of all, are pretty secretive, I mean, the actual price. I mean, you may they, you can post a price, but what's actually, um, I mean, that may be the build price, the sticker price, um, but what's actually ends up being paid typically has, show, has is very different from that first price. And, and again, um, as uh, has been pointed out, Often it bears very little resemblance to what the treatment, what that actual knee replacement, MRI, aptendectomy, what that really, what does that really cost? Because that's the big mystery. And I think that it's a little disingenuous when, when, um, uh, when policymakers or politicians say, well, patients need to be more proactive in try, in, and price shop and find that cheaper hospital, find that cheap, because I think it's much more difficult than that. We're not buying refrigerators here where you can just compare because the prices, the actual prices are um, just so all over the map and what is billed is, off, is so very different than what is actually paid. So that makes it very difficult to price shop. And I do, I do hear from, from patients who are very frustrated. They want to do that. They just don't know how. And if you call and say, what is your price for X, you may or may not get a number. Yeah, um, if, I, if, I, if I can. Please, Dan. I, yeah. I, I, I heard from, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not like a long time. There's no, there's, there's that. Finding, finding the right price. I heard from a reader who listened to this morning who said uh, he and his wife were recently told they had to, they should get tested uh, with a kind of uh, an ultrasound of the heart called an echocardiogram because their son has a heart condition that he was born with. You know, should get checked out too. So he went to the doctor through his employer's insurance and uh, and he paid about 350 bucks. That was his out-of-pocket expense. His wife had different insurance. And at first, her insurance couldn't tell her whether her doctor was in network. Okay, they canceled that appointment. Then they, after a long time, they find out the doctor is in network, making an appointment. But then he says, we couldn't figure out how much her out-of-pocket costs would be. Would be. After several calls, again, not everybody has this luxury. Not everybody, some people are like, I, I cut my finger on the buzzsaw. i got to get treated right now. But after several calls, it came down to this. If the ultrasound was performed in the doctor's office, our out-of-pocket cost of the test would be zero. But because the test is only offered in the outpatient wing of the hospital, which shares the building with the doctor's office, by the way, we would be responsible for the entire cost, estimated at more than $2,000. So that, um, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. But basically, this one procedure, could, which, is, I mean, which is really simple, it's an ultrasound, basically. I mean, it's complicated, but it's not... Uh, rocket science, um, you know, is going to cause the, the, the cost and what, what's billed and what the patient costs or the patient pays under the same insurance plan with the same doctor in the same building is going to be super different because um, of all these backroom deals, the ways the hospitals are looking to try to figure out how to maximize the revenue coming in on one side. Well, I'm glad the discussion has moved to, you know, the impact of all of this on patients. Um, you've both described how very difficult it is for a patient to navigate this thicket of prices, many of which are completely hidden. They might not know to ask about a cash price. And I, we have a question 
from one of the listeners as to whether or not you can ask for the cash price if you do, in fact, have insurance. And so do you have any advice for patients? Um, is there any best way to proceed if you're trying to avoid a surprise bill like that? Well, on the cash price, the problem, the problem, at, the problem there, um, and this in, in the cases that I profiled in my story, all of this was retroactive. They said, oh, you should have asked for a cash price. But if, I, I'm, not convinced, I'm not sure that if you went in and asked what is your cash price, you would get a straight answer. Um, I, I, uh, so I'm, and also, I'm not sure that that is a great strategy because you're paying an insurance premium. I mean, presumably that is supposed to be, you know, covering that and you're working towards your deductible or it's, it's covering that. And if you're just taking out, if you're just simply paying cash for everything, um, I'm not sure that's a great solution. Uh, and I, I can't, I think that it's not worth, I mean, it's certainly worth asking if it's something that's like stitches, something that's not going to be terribly expensive, I say go ahead and ask. You say, okay, I have insurance, but um, what if I paid you cash? What price would you give? It's almost like bartering. I think in, in some cases that might work. I'm not sure that that would work in a major medical situation, uh, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so let me ask one more question, and we're going to let our listeners get in here. So these are really compelling stories, and I'm really glad that you um, both have been reporting on this particular issue. Can you explore for me just what is the role of media in exposing this, in illuminating it? Should we... Um, should we be doing more of this type of stories? Or of this type of story, are there follow-on stories? Um, a lot of people in our audience are consumer advocates. Is there a role for them to work with you with respect to these types of stories? Anything you'd like to weigh in here with respect to just the role of media in dealing with this very difficult phenomenon? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> yes, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm doing this full time. This is it. This, I think there's. I mean, you're asking me, and I'm saying like, yes. Uh, it's definitely my hope that if there's a role for media in our society, it's to uh, shine a light on stuff that we all need to know about and to facilitate a public conversation about like, what are we going to do about it? And putting putting out a common set of facts, so we all know what the hell we're dealing with. Kind of the project of this show. Is there a role for consumer advocates? Yes, please. Um, my email address is dan at armandalegshow.com. Um, please get in touch. <laughs> we have a, you could also, and maybe the better front door is the contact form on our website, which all goes to the same place, but it makes it easier for me to see everything, is armandalegshow.com slash contact. That'll allow me to put everything in a, in a, in a, in a great big pile with these other stories, other sources. Um, yes, please get in touch. Uh, you're seeing things that I need to know about. Um, so yeah, and hopefully, you know, yeah, I mean, bring, I think, I hear from listeners all the time. Like, I use, I use this something I learned, I heard about on your show, and save money, um, which makes me feel really good. Or, you know, we're, everyone wants to know more, and it, it, it is the goal of this show to be useful um, and entertaining, but, most, but, you know, useful above all. So yeah, please, please get in touch. Arm and the Lake Show, dot com slash contact. Um, let me know who you are and what you know. <laughs> um, let me jump in and, and reiterate that absolutely that this is this is this is the power. And um, by telling by highlighting real people with real bills and real experiences I think what that does is it lifts it from being sort of an abstract policy discussion to where readers or listeners can say, hey, wait, that happened to me. And I can't tell you the number of times that um, somebody has said to me, I thought I was the only one. I thought this was a one-off. And especially with medical bills, surprise medical bills, balance billing, those things, 
I think a lot of times, unless it's just, you know, in, in no, some just astronomical amount, a lot of people will just pay them. They will enter into payment agreements because they think they have to. They don't realize that actually there is some, um, that, there, that there's, there's, there's some relief. And a lot of times that relief comes from just making noise. And uh, just very quickly, um, to give you, a, give you an example, in Texas, which had the absolute worst record of surprise medical bills and balance billing, uh, just this last year, they passed a spate of legislation. And Texas now has the strongest consumer protections against um, in medical billing in the nation. And a lot of that comes just from outcry, from people, you know, just keeping the pressure on uh, and of, of reporters and uh, telling different stories, lots and lots and lots of different ways. Consumer consumer advocates, I think, have a role in. I think that when it's um, you know working, maybe working with the media um, and helping to get those stories out. I think there's real difference. I mean, there's a real difference that can be made, and. Um, whether it, I mean, I'm not sure that it solves the problem, the whole problem, but it certainly solves it for the person that's looking at a thirty-six thousand dollar bill that they should never have gotten in the first place. Yes, well said. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Well, we are going to get let our listeners get in here. There are two ways to ask a question of this great panel. One is you can unmute by pressing star six. You've all been muted. And you can ask a question verbally, and I'm going to create some uh, pauses so you can do that. You can also type your question into chat, and um, I'm going to start us off by just reading a couple of those questions so that um, everyone can hear them. One person asked on kind of a, a private chat, why do hospitals give in to media pressure but otherwise fail to change their gouging practices? Anybody have a comment on that? I'm laughing well, I, over here. Oh, I think that's <laughs> well, I, you know, I think it's what I just said. I mean, does it solve the, do, do keeping the medical pressure, keeping the pressure up on? Does that solve it? We we were we were saying, you know, it's you know health health coverage through journalism. I mean, that's obviously not a sustainable model. But I think that it's you know, I think you build on that. And I think when I when I started writing about um, Medical surprise medical bills in Texas two years ago. They said the law will never ever change. This is Texas. It will never ever change, and it just changed. So I think you know the 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 answer is that if you don't if you you know I think you have to keep the pressure up. I think you have to keep the pressure on to to um, to make to make those changes. Uh, Dan, do you want to get in there? I, amen. Yeah, this, I mean, we're looking for sure on an individual case if you don't have a reporter or somebody else powerful kind of like pulling a string for you. I mean, I hear from people all the time who do all the things, who make all the calls, and they just get stiff. Um, they just get sort of, you know, they just get a stiff arm. Um, and, yeah, I think Jenny's story is, is I'm like, yeah, how can I, uh, where, where can I apply some pressure to get actual results? I mean, Jenny's reporting you know, super, super powerful. Uh, it's something that reporters want to do. And, you know, you can help us. I mean, we need your help to, to connect with the people whose stories, you know, make the case and to, you know, help dig up. It takes a lot of getting original medical documents, of hunting down, you know, what the policies are on paper. We have, we can, because it's our job, like call the hospital and be like, is this your policy? You do this on purpose? And you know, they have to publicly answer us or publicly not answer us, right? Let it be reported mm -hmm. they declined to say. Like, that's powerful. Um, you know, like, yeah, we could use all the help we can get in, in, <laughs> well, in, 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 in knowing, knowing exactly what questions to ask. 
Yes, excellent. Um, well, if we have time, I'm going to come back to this that question. But let me move on to just a couple others. Um, so I think that at least a couple in the audience really want to nail down this answer. In order to pay the cash price, because that's a pretty useful tip, do patients have to say they don't have insurance, or can they be like mum on that point? Boy, I wish I could answer that one, uh, and, I, and I just can't. I think it's different. Uh, uh, I have. I, it seems to me like I heard that the reason that they don't offer a cash price is they. Ha I think that at least. I think that in Texas, I think that the state law is is that you have. That's why they ask you if you have other insurance when you have when you put down one. Do you have any others? I think you have to disclose whether you have insurance. But I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think it's wor definitely worth asking. I think a great resource would be to call your re your state regulator and ask them and say, "Look, I I'm getting this wildly. You know, I I um, you know, it, what would happen if I paid cash? I, I think that's the best. That you, then that way you're you're going to get the the proper answer. And then if you get a different answer from the provider. You can come back and say yes, but the state insurance commissioner said, you know, X. That's mm -hmm. uh, But like I said, I, I can't I can't answer that one just across the board. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, Hello. D, yes, please go ahead. Did Hi, you want to yeah, ask I a question? Asking, yeah, since many of these are found after the fact, what is the advice? for us to tell consumers on how to fight it or follow up or whatever. So if, if, like in cash or in any, uh, in, if, if there's a, uh, a big disparity, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. How would, the, I mean, how would they even know if they got a bill they didn't anticipate getting? Um, and contacted us saying, my gosh, I can't pay this. What do I do now? What are the next steps? Uh, again, I would say that many states have a some sort of a, uh, a mediation or an arbitration. I think the first step is to call your insurer and, um, and see what they can do. Uh, if they dig in their heels and say, no, we're not going to pay any more than this, then I think you, your next step has got to be to go to your regulatory body and file a complaint. You can file a complaint with an insurance commission office. You can file a complaint with the attorney general's office if you feel like you it's something that's been fraudulent. Um, and uh, this is Lynn, I, I would, and I'll just add, yeah, a couple. Go ahead, Dan, and then I'll, I have a couple steps in addition. Go ahead. I, I want to hear your tip. Yeah, go ahead. Well, um, other options that patients should explore if um, they're just pay facing a bill that they couldn't possibly afford is to see if the hospital or provider has charity care policies. Um, many people don't realize that most hospitals have policies to help patients who can't afford the bill, also sometimes drug companies, something to be explored. Um, also, if you can challenge a health plan's coverage decision, if you feel it's in error, and a lot of times people need some help to do that, but there are usually, um, in many states, there are resources, uh, consumer helplines to help you with that process. So those are a few other things that a patient could do. I, I, yeah, I would just add, like, uh, I mean, and nothing, there's no one thing that works in every case. And, you know, everything is an it depends kind of question. But definitely, like, calling the provider and, and, and looking for, for help and being open and honest. I, I talked with one person whose job it is to help all community people do this, advocate for themselves. And she's like, right, you ask, you can ask, do you have a charity care policy or financial aid form? You can ask, you can just kind of say like, hey, uh, I'm essentially indigent. What, what could we accept? The, the, what, what might you be able to accept, you know, on a basis where the, that you'll feel okay about it? And um, there's a couple other tips that she shared with me. One of them is, um, you can ask for something called a super bill, which essentially is a much more itemized list of what they're actually charging you for. And uh, this takes more homework, but you can look up um, the price that Medicare then pays for everything that's on that super bill. They're saying, like, we gave you an aspirin, and, you know, we charged you $20. Well, what, you know, Medicare has a standard rate that it pays for an aspirin in your region. 
and that's public. You can look it up online. And you could, you know, once you have that super bill, look at it, compare it to what Medicare expenses and says like, and you go back to be like, hey, um, Medicare pays five dollars for an aspirin. Do I give you five? Um, and see what they say. He advises like, you know, be really nice. You're the sweetest, most patient person. Um, because the person that you're dealing with, although to you, they are the face of this horrible bureaucracy that's trying to gut you for money. I mean, there is a person with a job, and you want them to become, you kind of need them to be your advocate. Um, so you got to cultivate that. Uh, it sounds so hard, honestly. And it does not, and there's no guarantee that any particular course of action will result. I would agree, uh, I would agree that. I would agree that um, I think the, the I think persistence is huge because I think that there is often a a sense that that first person you get on the phone, whether it is the the doctor's office, of, the the billing office, or the insurance customer service, um, that's usually um, not going to get you the satisfaction. I think you need to just keep calling and become and be very you know you can be polite. Uh, if you want, but you need to be persistent. And um, and like I said, every um, every plan is different, has different rules. Um, every a hospital, I think that the indigent care is a uh, is a great idea. Um, I, I'll give you one one very quick um, example of how wildly different the prices can be. Um, I recently wrote a story about a woman who's. $195,000 radiation treatment was denied. Um, she was having a, an issue with an insurance company. Uh, it was not one of the larger ones. And she was working with the hospital, and they said, okay, well, we will change you your status from insured to uninsured. And that automatically reduced the price to $70,000. And she said, well, I don't know, which is kind of, there, there's, uh, there's, that's a whole different discussion. But she said, well, I don't have $70,000 either. And they said, okay, well, we'll reduce it to thirty-five. And And she said, and uh, I think they're still negotiating that point out. But in that, in that space of that conversation, it went from 195 to 35. So that shows you that a lot of these bills, I mean, these, these numbers are somewhat fictional and that there is a lot of wiggle room. Yes, I think we have a theme here, <laughs> an important theme that's very uh, challenging for patients. Would another listener like to verbally ask a question by pressing star six? Okay, well, interrupt us if you want to. Um, I will add to our recorded record here that uh, Bonnie made a, a very useful um, correction or enhancement to what we were discussing. If you have health insurance, but it is not a type of health insurance regulated by the state, and that's typically health insurance you buy on your own or from a smaller size employer, um, if you have a large, then you can do the grievance and appeals and use the helplines. Uh, but often, if you have health insurance from a large employer, that might be regulated at the federal level. And it's very difficult to get the Department of Labor to help you. But Bonnie mentions another avenue, which she describes as peer-to-peer -peer review appeals. And um, so just one more strategy in response to the earlier question. So um, I'll take one more pause, see if anybody wants to ask a question. Just a moment here. So I am, um, what we are talking about here, the amount of persistence to negotiate a price, uh, you were given a price from some sort of healthcare provider and it's completely unaffordable and it might be completely out of whack with the cost to provide the service. The things we've been talking about here between the research ahead of time to the negotiating of a price after the fact, trying to bring it down, these are enormous lifts for patients. And I think for a lot of us on the phone today, it really seems unfair. It seems like consuming health care should be a lot more straightforward. Um, I wonder, Jenny or Dan, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I think it is unfair. And I think you have to also remember that typically 
these are people who who are fighting large bills are doing so while sick <laughs> or recovering and um, and I think that that adds a whole different layer to it is is that you're it, this is under duress and um, now maybe you know something routine but a large emergency room bill or perhaps like uh, Dan's example of brain cancer I mean those things are highly stressful and I think to add on to the idea that you're you know you're entering into some high stakes negotiation with large companies whether it's the provider or the insurer um, is is it is exceptionally unfair I remember um, a patient once told me you know we have um, um, we have we have the smallest voice and the smallest pockets but it's it, but it, it's all falling on us and I think mm -hmm. that's that's very true mm-hmm a lot of the stories we've been talking about today are people who have um, employer coverage or maybe they buy private insurance coverage on their own. Have you been hearing similar stories from people with Medicare coverage? Not me, but I haven't. But, uh, but is it Penny? No, I, I actually uh, have not really uh, looked at Medicare much. Uh, I'm, I, I, I confess that that is not a, a part of my coverage. Well, no, I wasn't trying to catch you out. The reason I <laughs> asked is because uh, Medicare ha uh, prices, we know from research that's been done by economists and others, Medicare, um, if you're covered by Medicare, you don't encounter this level of price variation. There's, uh, I think Dan mentioned it earlier, there are publicly posted prices as to what Medicare pays. and um, so I think that while there may be uh, like things about the cost-sharing structure of Medicare that might make it difficult for patients, this underlying price that you have to pay, is, I expect they wouldn't encounter that type of variation. Um, and so I was just wondering if you'd seen any stories. Well, like the that. but the problem with with well, the only problem with that is because those negotiated prices are so much lower than the um, what's out in the marketplace. Um, a lot of providers don't take it. Um, you know that is that is one complaint that I've heard. Or if they, or, or if you're talking about price and you you talk about a percentage, you know you say it's so you know a percentage of the Medicare or you know I mean it's Medicare times you know whatever. Uh, it uh, they'll they'll say it's it's so low that they can't make a living, and so a lot of times that. Uh, that Medicare argument gets sort of tossed aside, and, uh, mm -hmm. and sometimes providers say, "Well, that's, you know, I don't take Medicare because they don't pay me enough." It's not real. They say they uh, a lot of providers will complain that the Medicare reimbursement level is an unrealistic level; it's too low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so you because uh, it used to be that almost every provider took Medicare, but that's really changing. You're saying, and so are some of the listeners in the chat box. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just oh, I see sort of reiterating what what I'm hearing. Um. So we um. Do we have any listeners today who also report, um, do healthcare reporting? If so, we I wouldn't mind having you weigh in if you want to um, unmute and press star six. I know that we had some people, at least uh, at the beginning. Well, they're all shy. Okay. Well, um, so... What else do you, uh, Bonnie, or sorry, not Bonnie, <laughs> I was chatting with Bonnie, Jenny or Dan, do you have similar stories in your queue or are there stories that you'd like to write that would sort of take this to the next level or link it back to policy solutions? Anything like that coming up for either of you? Well, I've sort of moved um, away. Uh, I've ex I've expanded. I tend I find that my story one story begets another, and um, that many of them are reader driven. Um, that I'll write one story and somebody will say yes, but what about this? And I'll write about that, uh, and that takes me off in a whole different direction. 
Um, one thing that I am starting to look at is the rise of plan, um, insurance plans that are um, non-compliant to the Affordable Care Act rules. Um, and with the lack of penalty now and some of the guardrails down, um, there is a push for these kind of plans that um, a lot of people think they're getting health coverage, but in actuality they are not. They don't. It doesn't cover very much. It's great until you have to use it. Um, so that is a. I think that is a coming um, story that's going to just get hotter. That, that makes yeah. That's huge. I. You know, my next season. Um, it would, we don't quite have the elevator pitch nailed down, but it, this is it for us. It's self-advocacy. Um, what what can possibly work? The uh, the the non the the, the, the holding. Elevator picks is holding the places uh, that a cavalry is not coming. We're going to have to figure out the best we can do in the interim. And all of the things that we're talking about, about how do you negotiate with a provider? How do you figure out what something like this costs you? How do you negotiate with your insurance company? All that stuff. Like, you know, how do you protect yourself, basically, from all from the kind of crazy uh, stuff you can get hit with? That, that's my main focus right now. Um, I want to know. I'm looking for people who, you know, who, who've had, who spent some time in the trenches, and can give us the best estimates. My my impression is, you know, it's a combination. Like a lot of things, it's a combination of how persistent you are and dedicated to it, and you know, the the kind of skills that you, the assets and skills that you bring to it as a person, as a negotiator, um, and a little bit and luck, like. You know, I've talked to people who are very, who are super persistent, super skilled, super smart, and hit a complete brick wall. Um, and so, and it, as Jenny said, like lots of people are facing these kind of questions at points where their 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 personal lives are super compromised because they're sick. So, yeah, building that toolkit, figuring out to lay the land uh, is my number one. Right. So, um, but. Here at the Healthcare Value Hub, um, one of the things that we've done is different types of focus group and uh, work over the years, and the majority of the U.S. population really lacks the confidence to be like that super consumer that brings all these skills and can pursue it to the end and get a result. Many of them feel like they can't surmount the obstacles of, that the health system puts in front of them. You know, who's going to tell their story? Uh, yeah, I'm telling those stories. I mean, that's, that's where we are. Where we are sucks. There's just zero question about it. it as Jenny said, it's yeah. completely unfair. Um, Healthcare by journalism. <laughs> you know, it just yeah, doesn't. Right. It is. It's unsustainable. But it. It. You, you, but if you don't have that, then what do you have? I mean, so you have to. I. Just, I just think you. Just keep, you keep pushing. I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of media out there. I think there's a lot of consumer advocate groups. Um, you know, I think a great resource is AARP. They have whole healthcare policy people. You know, if if you feel you've been wronged, complain. Don't just because if you feel like you've been wronged, you, a lot of times you actually have been. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. you know, so so don't don't suffer in silence. And um, and I also I really think uh, optimistically that you know uh, that that the, it's a, it's a big ship to turn around. But I do think that the more noise people make, I mean, policymakers do pay attention. P politicians pay attention because that you know, uh, healthcare was was you know was. The, was a real driver in the 2018 election. So I think people need to make some noise. Yeah, it, it's polling as the uh, the top issue that people on both sides of the aisle are concerned about. Um, do you do either of you think? I, I do think that if we're not going to do healthcare by journalism, um, some of the protections that consumers need will have to come from policymakers. Um, do you think that we we're going in that direction, or that you might be writing stories about um, 
you know, protective policies that have been put in place in states around the country? One story that I'm pitching to my collaborators right now, and I'm looking for actually another reporter to take it on, is a follow-up to a story we did last week. Um, there were there was a couple. They thought they were up to date. They were pregnant. They thought they were up to date on paying their health insurance. It turned out they sent a payment to a hospital run by the same company that managed their insurance program, and uh, they got a letter saying they were done. And they did all the things. They just worked like crazy. Uh, no avail. They were ended up hospitalized twice because the pregnancy ran into complications. Um, they eventually got offered um, for another insurance company to kind of pick them up with intervention from the state, but they were still going to be out like ten to fifteen thousand dollars where they would have been if none of this had happened. And after all of it went down, and I got their full story, one of the questions was, could that possibly have been legal? Like, what was the deal there? And what we found, I mean, it took weeks of back and forth just to, with various agencies, just to even figure out who the regulator was on this policy. Um, insurance policies are regulated in this state by the Department of Commerce. However, it turned out on closing inspection, this was an HMO contract, which meant it was regulated by the Department of Health. Um, one set of statutes covers insurance, another covers HMOs. And I finally dug down, found the guy to help he had a straight answer, like, was this legal? And he was like, well, the law, here's the, here's the citation to the law. The law says you have to get notice. But there's also this regulation that was promised. The regulation was worded in such a way as to essentially make it legal, give legal cover for what had happened. It was a weirdly worded regulation. And it didn't, uh, it said basically, supposed to be 30 days, but unless you voluntarily cancel and Failing to make your prepayment uh, shall be considered voluntary cancellation. Um, and I ask, like, well, does this contemplate an, a situation in which a good faith effort to pay has been made, which it has, and got zero response on that? And I want to go. The story, you know, that was that was as far as we got. We chased it pretty hard. But the story that I want to do next is like, how did that sentence get written in that regulation? Somebody. Can Somebody wrote it down. Somebody approved it. Somebody suggested it. Um, I want to know. It's no, I, mean, it's, I mean, anything was knowable. Most things are knowable if you look hard enough and have the right, have the right connections and the right sources. I think it would be extremely revealing to know how did that little thing get written that made this legal. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I'm familiar with the story, and I'll just add, the, when they sent that check to the hospital, it got cashed. They had yeah. no way of knowing they had not properly paid their health plan. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. So it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's outrageous. Yeah. Um, well, so, yeah, I, so I, think, I think this question of, like, how does, how does policy change happen, one of the things that, one of the reasons I'm interested in this story is, Find out how we can affect the levers of, of government power. You know, we want to know how sausages got made that were the crummy sausages that we're eating got made in the first place, and where we need to add our voices to, to get better sausage made. I think there was a fascinating story that just uh, Bloomberg just uh, had. It, there's a there's a, a an ad campaign right now that's going um, of a group that is running a lot of ads um, in, in states where Senate, um, where congressmen are in um, hotly contested races. And they're basically trying to break down the patient protections that's before Congress right now. And, and uh, it's a group that nobody's quite sure who's behind it, who's funding it, and all of that. But a lot of times, I know it sounds like cliche, but um, I think what Dan is talking about is when you look at the way these some of these laws and policies are written. A lot of times, there is a um, um, there's a, they, they're influenced by people who um, who have a you know have a financial stake. And I think as reporters and and as consumer advocates, I think 
we need to uh, keep looking at that, you know, follow the money and all that. It's, like I said, it's kind of a cliche, but I think that it, it's a cliche because it's, it works, it's true. And I think that there is a, I think that there is so much money in healthcare, and that is why we have all of these problems. Everybody, you know, is find, trying to find a way around the, the existing regulations, and unfortunately, it's the patients that too often get get stuck. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to have to bring this to a close. It's been a great conversation. Uh, listeners, as always, we have the Hub has resources to help you with these problems. We have a great infographic, if you haven't seen it before, that talks about how much healthcare prices have gone up over the years. We're going to have links to the stories that Dan and Jenny described on the resources page. And we have two, resor two webinars in October that you can sign up for right now. With that, uh, Dan and Jenny, thank you so much. You have been very generous of your time. It was really great. Uh, and as always, we thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which sponsors the webinar series, as well as the Healthcare Value Hub itself. Everyone have a great day. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all. Bye. -bye. Bye.